This is a reading from Secrets Kept, Secrets Told. It's called Farting Through Gas Masks. For Londoners, during the 1940-41 Blitz, clear skies meant a restless night. Thick clouds, once so depressing, promised relief and a night's sleep. Whoever went out at night walked in darkness. White lines on curbs, trees, lamp posts, and even on the mud guards of buses helped us to find our way without bumping into things. Just a tiny crack in people's curtains provoked the air raid warden to shout, Put that bloody light out! There were sandbags all over London, trenches in the parks, and sticky paper strips crisscrossed on all windows. Sandbags and trenches were to provide shelter and protection from blasts and bullets. Sticky paper was to lessen the danger of flying shards of glass. For us kids, daylight air raids offered welcome breaks from boring lessons. With the first wail of the siren, we walked single file and in silence to the cellar or to the space under the stairs or to the civic air raid shelter. Headmasters and matrons counted heads and checked us off against school registers while teachers stood in the falling dust and bits of plaster to lead us in rousing choruses of one man went to mow and Hitler has a bunion as we did our best to drown out the screaming bombs and the sounds of destruction above us. I'll never forget the old man who sat in the dark in one London shelter, hardly able to muster the breath necessary to whisper, Don't forget your gas masks! We carried our gas masks wherever we went, and we soon discovered we could make excellent farting noises by blowing hard through our gas masks. Since so many of us were fighting during gas drills, the teachers couldn't sort out anyone in particular for punishment until we were ordered to take those bloody things off. When we lived on the outskirts of London, near Croydon, and didn't have a cellar, we had a shelter in the back garden, measuring about five feet by eight feet. The pit was covered with corrugated tin and sandbags, then heaped up with earth. Shelters contained bunk beds and food and other supplies, to keep us through long raids. As often as not, garden shelters held only muddy water and perhaps a floating doll or teddy bear or bits of soggy clothing remind us that children had spent drier days playing house or doctor. I don't think we ever used our garden shelter except for keeping vegetables. Very few people had refrigeration. We certainly didn't. Some people lived in partially bombed out houses with blankets and sheets hung for privacy. We visited friends of my uncle who lived with dust, dust and dust and mouldy cracked ceilings. In the public shelters, when we did have to go to them, I remember the smell of sweat and wet and soiled nappies and the stale reek of fish and chips in old newspapers. Uh, we children were warned a lot about many things. Don't pick up lost toys, packets of sweets, uh, model aeroplanes. The Germans had dropped them, uh, we were told. Innocent-looking explosive materials. They were dropped into parks and fields and city streets. As soon as unsuspecting children picked them up, bam! Underground stations had bunk beds three high. Families undressed in public, played cards, chatted, sang and yelled at their kids to stop chasing up and down the platforms while trains whistled in and out of tunnels. Mothers searched for missing children. Sometimes children, lost, homeless and terrified, searched station to station for their mothers, grandparents, aunts and uncles. Uncle Sievert took me one day to see where London's homeless lived. Several times he reminded me that if it wasn't for him, Jennifer and I could be living in the London tubes, scrounging for food with the other lost children. I knew I had to be extra good and always do what I was told. Thank you. <laughs>